Hi, welcome to Exploring the World Ocean. I'm Sean Chamberlain. In today's series of lectures, we're going to talk about ocean physics. The physics of the ocean and the study of the physics of the ocean really forms the foundation of the study of oceanography. These are the kinds of studies that were carried out by the Challenger expedition and other early oceanographic expeditions. But in many ways, the physics of the ocean also touches on the chemistry and the biology of the ocean. If you recall, the physical environment of the ocean is what defines where organisms live or their habitats. So our study of ocean physics naturally takes us into a study of marine organisms as well. Let's have a look at what the study of physical oceanography involves. First of all, we'll take a look at how improvements in technology have enabled oceanographers to better understand the physical properties of the world ocean. Believe it or not, improvements in even something as simple as a thermometer have had vast and incredible impacts on the study of physical oceanography. How does knowledge of physical properties of the ocean help us understand ocean physics? And so the physical, the physical properties of water themselves has an impact in a, in a large and global way. And we'll take a look at that as well. We also want to act and ask importantly, how does Earth's seasonal cycle affect the world ocean? And given that we just went through the first day of fall, first full day of fall, it's important and it's timely to look at what causes a seasonal cycle on Earth and how that impacts the world ocean. And finally, let's take a look at why is the ocean blue? It's a question that people have had for many, 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 probably centuries, if not longer. And it's probably a question that some of you have as well. And it's one of my favorite questions to answer because it involves some of the research that I did as a graduate student and postdoc at the various institutions where I studied. To be able to really understand oceanography, as we've said before, and fully understand the world ocean and the physics of the world ocean, really means we have to understand the scales of variability. And as we talked about in the first chapter, that involves scales of space or spatial scales, things from really millimeters, nanometers, all the way up to kilometers or miles, and also scales of time, things from seconds to century. I'd recommend that you pull out the fold-out map on the, uh, or study the figure on the inside front cover, cover of your book, and it will give you some idea of the spatial and temporal variability that oceanographers are trying to understand in the world ocean. As it turns out, progress in understanding how the ocean works and the physical properties of the ocean has really involved progress towards increasing our spatial resolution of the ocean. In other words, measuring ocean properties in more places in the world ocean, and also increasing our ability to measure how things change through time. And it's a really good chance in this chapter to take a look at progress in oceanography over the last couple decades and see how improvements in technology have improved both our resolution on spatial scales as well as our re resolution over time. And we'll take a look at that. Well, most people think that measuring something as simple as the temperature is a relatively simple act. I'm sure many of you have had your temperature taken by a doctor or your mom when you were sick and it seemed very simple. Either you had a thermometer put underneath your tongue or maybe you had one of those new fancy infrared ones that stick in your ear. I don't think people measure temperature the way they used to, which is mm, not so comfortable. You know what I'm talking about. In any case, measuring the temperature of the ocean turned out not to be such a simple thing because to get a kind of measurement that's meaningful, in other words, a measurement that provides us with information that's important or information that tells us something about ocean processes, we need to be accurate within 0.01 degrees Celsius. That means then that a thermometer has to have enough little tick marks, if you think of it in terms of a regular mercury thermometer, to give us a resolution so that we can tell the difference between 0.01 and 0.02. Our thermometer has to be that accurate in the ocean in order to give us meaningful data about how the ocean works as a physical system. To do that, ocean, and those instruments also have to be very precise. It means that when you stick that thermometer in your mouth, it has to give the exact same reading every time, provided you're at normal temperature. When we stick our thermometer or other instruments for measuring temperature in the ocean, they, we want them to give us the same answer every time. 
provided that the temperature hasn't changed. That's precision. So instruments in oceanography, something even as simple as measuring temperature, require both precision and accuracy to get meaningful numbers that we can do something with. Well, despite all of our best attempts, and even here in the year 2008, the ocean, because of its vast size, remains what we call undersampled. Undersampling means that we don't yet have enough measurements of the ocean to be able to fully tell what's going on, in other words. We might say, yeah, it's warm over there, but right next to it, it might be warmer or colder, and we really can't tell that. We don't have the kind of resolution yet over the entire scale of the ocean to be able to tell that. But as we'll see, we've made some vast improvements in that area. 